opposed to just oh, and we got it. Excellent. Um, so my comp the story, quick story of my company, it was founded a little over a year ago um, after the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack. For those that don't remember, all of a sudden uh, at around May, it was suddenly very difficult to put fuel in our cars. And the reason I came to learn was because of a pipeline company in Pennsylvania that I had never heard of had a little bit of a cybersecurity whoopsie, and suddenly I couldn't put gas into my wife's car. Um, I have started to realize that if a similar attack was done on our food infrastructure, uh, that that meant that my fellow Americans would start going hungry. So I felt that I no longer could sit on the sidelines and decided to start my own business. Um, I am a proud member of the Maryland Farm Bureau as a friend of agriculture, and I've had a lot of very interesting conversations with actual farmers learning about what they think of cybersecurity. Uh, I learned very quickly that you know, farmers consider the term IT to be jargon. Uh, they know me as the smart computer guy, and I take that as the compliment that it is intended to be. Um, so I'd like at this point to run through a quick poll now that you know a little bit more about me, just who are you? Um, Diane had set this up, but um, I guess that's popped up here. Yep, the poll's on the screen. You're getting some responses. We have nine people here and we have answers from pretty much everybody. There's only one category missing. Do you wanna guess which category is not represented in this group? Here I'm you gonna go. guess I'm gonna share the results. Yep, that is, so that is not surprising. Um, all right, thank you for everyone. So I'll just click through this. So based on that, that's that's not, not typical. Farmers are sort of, again, their own world that I didn't really know, until I got into this, I didn't really have a lot of personal you know, interactions with them. Uh, but that was one of the things I'm really grateful for as I've gotten to learn. Uh, so what do I mean when I say ag tech innovations? Well, quite basically, it means adding technology of some sort into agricultural operations. That could be computers, sensors, drones, robotics, anything that allows for a more efficient use of um, our farming practices. If you've ever heard of the term Internet of Things or IoT, this is what they are referring to. It's basically to demystify it somewhat, it's putting a small computer into a device and then connecting that device with other ones and allow it to be remotely accessed. Um, the, the term in ag is, this is called precision agriculture, which is sort of your generalist term for, we are applying technology to make a more efficient use of our agricultural infrastructure. Um, so some of the benefits that people are seeing is quite simply, it allows us to get a much higher crop productivity uh, for the same amount of land. That's the one thing that we can't create more of is land. And this allows us to make a much more efficient use of what we actually have. Uh, this in turn leads to lower food prices. Um, this is something that is very important, especially in a time of inflation, but generally more food means that there will be more for people to eat for lower prices. Um, the more modern technology allows us for a much more efficient use. Instead of just spraying pesticides or chemical fertilizers across the old field, farmers can now spot treat their farms and just generally use less chemicals in the basics of farming. This lowers their cost and leads to significantly higher worker safety. These chemicals are one of the most noxious things one will come into contact to, and the less they can be introduced into the environment, the better. Um, as we're using automation robots, uh, dealing with sharp things and repeatable processes, it just keeps squishy humans away from some of the you know, more dangerous pieces of that in general. Um, and we're seeing a much lower reduced environmental impact on our farm practices, which again, is very important as we try to combat potential climate change and make sure that we have a sustainable model for feeding our world population. Um, as promised, here's a few examples of some of the coolest 21st century act tech that I've uh, run into. So they have these things called water management or smart irrigations where, and this is a program that I'm working with Diane on, um, 
called farm beats where there are sensors that go into the soil. Uh, the computers will pull those sensors and you'll get real time data on what moisture is there, when pesticides need to be applied, all sent to your central smartphone. Um, tractors, mechanization was one of the big places decades ago where farming benefited, but now those tractors are becoming smart tractors. They've added GPS guidance. There's the autonomous tractor, which can drive itself or be controlled by an app. Again, allowing for larger tracts of land to be farmed with fewer people um, in all weather conditions um, and the convenience of, of an app. Uh, we're now adding smart cameras, artificial intelligence. This allows for remote uh, monitoring of, in animal ag of your flock or your herd of animals, determine if there's any that are sick, see if there's any <laughs> places where you have greenhouses that you know the plants aren't doing well. Uh, and you have what you see at the bottom is an example of a, a learning robot that will apply the needed materials to plants in one of these test greenhouses. It's pretty neat stuff. Um, we have sort of the single pane of glass farm management software. Traditionally, farm this was a lot of this was done on by hand in notebooks um, over the hundreds of years that some of these farms have been in operation. Now it's all being taken to the cloud with modern technology that again can allow farmers to get more efficient use out of their land and get higher profits overall. Um, and last, this is everyone's favorite drones. It feels like everything has drones in it um, and they're used from everything from applying pesticides or mon mapping out farmland and determining what the boundaries are. Uh, one story I'll share real quick of a cool use of drones that I heard about was from one of my friends who worked on a farm out West and it was a weather collection program. So there were 10 remote farm fields where these special weather drones were gonna fly around poll, gather real-time information, and then deposit it at a central base station that was hooked up to a 4G modem. And this was supposed to save them lots of money and be, have a very low overhead. Well, the first month in operation, um, they got a little bit of a surprise, um, which I will tell you about after we get to the next part. Um, I wanted this to be a more interactive, so I wanted to take the chance to do a breakout session here. Um, and as a reminder, just uh, introduce yourselves to each other. And the question that I'm hoping that you can help me ask is, based on everything that I just told you about these wondrous innovations and technologies, what could possibly go wrong um, with those being released? Um, and this is meant to be somewhat lighthearted, but just if you could think of something that could, a problem, just you know, share it amongst yourselves and uh, we'll come back, I guess. All right, I set it up for seven minutes. So I'm gonna open up the rooms and we'll divide up into two groups and then we'll come back together again. So that was a good breakout session. And so now that we're back and we've talked about, you know, the different horror stories, I just want to finish that story. So again, my, my friend launched this drone weather collection initiative. Um, and it was supposed to save them money. It was supposed to be inexpensive. And when they got the bill in the mark, um, they opened it up and it was for $80,000. Ooh. Yeah. So apparently those 10 4G modems that were out there were not secured in any way. Hackers found them and used them for robo-dialing. And they ran up an $80,000 phone bill in one month. Oh. And there's not really a whole lot you can do. Um, and that was, my friend felt kind of sheepish about that one. <laughs> it, it didn't turn out to save as much money, but it just sort of shows that the problem with a lot of these attacks is that the first warning that you get is the ransom note, at which point it's too late, basically. Um, let's go back to sharing. Let's see on there. All right, so thank you for participating. That was great. I love seeing that kind of interaction. Um, so what's really worrisome is, again, these 21st century threats is, Everyone was talking about cybersecurity is the big one. <laughs> um, cyber attacks, ransomware, uh, phishing, data theft, 
if you've read the newspapers or watched news or heard anything at all about this, it's really, really bad. Um, it's estimated by 2025 that it's going to cost $10.5 trillion in damage from cyber attacks, which would make it, I believe, the third largest economy in the world after the United States and China. Um, and then we have these complex supply chains that we can build through use of technology, but when they break, they break bigger and they break in new and exciting ways that we hadn't really considered before, where again, a pipeline company in a different state means I can't put fuel in my work car and I can't get to the office, you know, that sort of thing that you never would have expected. Um, I think someone's out in the... Um, and as before, the more we use technology, the more we become dependent. We no longer have the option of saying, okay, we'll just stop using computers, shut off the internet and go back to the way things were. That's not really possible anymore. And it's especially not considering the number of people that we now need to feed. The human population is close to 8 billion now. And these agricultural advancements are need to just straight up have enough food for everyone to get enough to eat. So the consequences uh, are quite dire. So what is the problem really that farmers are facing? Why are hackers going after small family farms? Well, their main goal is not to the farmer themselves, but the big ag company that they are part of the supply chain. The farmers are just simply seen as a means to an end and a quote unquote easy target because they believe them to be completely unsophisticated and they will use them as a stepping stone to get to their to the big ag company. Now, the small farm is destroyed in the process, but that's not really what the hackers are worried about. Um, so these are some of the challenges that farmers are facing with this. Number one, hackers are smart. Do not think of them as dumb criminals. These are extremely intelligent people who have used their computer science knowledge not for good. They've made a different life choice than we would have liked them to be. Um, those same computers that enable so many wonderful things now also are available for the hackers to use. And for the most part, hacks that are going out are not being done by humans. They're being done by automated processes on computers that never get tired and will just work until eventually they catch someone. Um, again, we've decided to connect everything to the internet and so what they call the attack surface is now enormous and any part of that chain being compromised is enough to cause significant damage. And the most simple problem is uh, hacking is profitable. Cybercrime is profitable. I wish it wasn't true, but many cases these are criminals and they're doing it because it gets them money. Uh, the goal is to make it not profitable so that they would just move on from what they're doing. Um, the other challenges, especially for small farms, is that the cybersecurity solutions that are available are extremely complex, extremely expensive, and are not even close to the budgets that a farmer could afford, and they don't have the technical know-how or staff to actually run them. It would just be an expensive thing that wouldn't get them any value. Uh, at the end of the day, these cybersecurity products do not grow them any crops. They do not get better prices at market. Um, and it doesn't really give them anything tangible. It's the issue of insurance. There was also this other thing called the acts of man. I was doing some research into crop insurance of all things. Um, and I will give you the very, very brief version of this. Uh, in crop insurance, that's what farmers purchase to insure their income, including a failed crop, you basically can pay for a percentage of what the rolling five-year uh, yield is for that land. So because you, if you have a bad year, you have very high capital costs and you don't want to go out of business. There is an exception in those coverage that they call acts of man. And the example that the insurance companies give is if there's an airplane flying over top of a farm and it's got a field of wheat, let's say, and the plane crashes through no fault of the farmer, and the entire wheat crop is lost. Well, that's considered an act of man and it's not covered by their insurance product. 
I would also argue that a cybersecurity attack, just like the ones that we described in the breakout sessions, are also acts of man. So the real problem here is that farmers would think that they're protected and they might not be. Uh, what I was told is that if they want to be protected, what they need to do is buy cybersecurity insurance. And I will tell you that in all the times talking to farmers, I have not found a single farmer that currently has or plans to get cybersecurity insurance, because again, they don't see the direct value of it, which is really a challenge. Um, you might be wondering, you know, I'm not a farmer. We saw in our, no one here is a farmer, so why should I care about this problem? Well, hackers do not only target farmers, hackers target everyone. And I'm not going to put a poll question up, but I'm very certain that everyone on this call likes to eat food. And I am one of them. And I do not know how to grow my own food. And if there's a major attack on our food supply, I run the risk of starving to death in three weeks. Um, again, complex supply chain, it is a very, very long plate from the farm to your plate. And if any of the things on your screen get disrupted, the whole chain breaks down and your grocery stores are empty. Again, food supply, I would argue, is our most critical infrastructure. Um, losing the access, easy access to fuel for Colonial Pipeline was a big hassle. Losing access to food would have been apocalyptic. Um, so that's, you know, which brings us to the next session where I, I really wanted to ask to get a poll of a uh, have you or someone you know been the victim of a cyber attack? And I'm not looking for personal details here, but just in general, if you know anyone, because this is one of those places where almost everyone does. So before we jump in there, are there any questions that anyone wants to ask? All right, we're short on questions. So we'll, we'll compare our horror stories. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. So thank you for sharing more uh, horror stories on that. Um, and let's see. So I wanted to jump into a quick poll here because this is one of the, this is the answer to what can oh, be good. done. Well, I'm on a conference call. I'll call you back. Bye. And this is the second poll. And if you can... Yep, launching. All right. He went for one extreme or the other. Either it's really fast or it's really long. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to see that. There were several people that got it right because it's, this is it's actually four to six months. Um, and I will say that that is usually surprising to most people when they hear that. I will freely blame television and movies that as you, that a gentleman like the one you see on your screen banging on a keyboard, encountering encryption, banging on the keyboard again, and he's through in seconds. It's actually far more boring. Um, it's very slow, systematic, and it, it's really hard. As I mentioned, the hackers are smart, but this little tidbit leads to, you know, what can be done to solve this problem. Um, so the first thing that I will say is to have what I call a cyber 911. Um, and what I mean by what the term cyber 911 refers to the individual you would reach out to if you got an email that said that, Everything was encrypted. We've stolen your identity. We're going to delete all the pictures of your kids unless you give us 10 Bitcoin. And we also wiped your phone. So I hope you have the number of someone if you're going to try to call for help. That's the person you call. That's your cyber 911. If your answer is I would fight it myself, well, then you might be a good cyber 911. Um, and as I'm doing with my parents, help your, your fellow people out in your friends, your family, your neighborhood. Um, in my research, I found that the most popular person listed by farmers when they would call for help was their grandchildren. 
it's their young people who are familiar with computers. Again, the average age of farmer in Maryland is 57. And there's well good representation in, in 70 and 80 year olds. And they reach out to their kids, their grandkids, the person in their neighborhood who knows computers well, whenever something, you know, goes up. The trick is to know who that person is ahead of time. Um, we teach our kids 911 if you need emergency services, we need to do the same for your cyber matters. Um, as mentioned in our breakout session, you need to practice what we call good cyber hygiene. And this just takes practice and the help of, again, a patient cyber 911 to look at an email like this and to not want to click it. Um, I hope that most people here would know that this is, you know, your classic phishing, but the problem is that a non-zero number of people are clicking on that link. And so it's up to us, the ones to, to with patience and understanding, teach them. This is not their fault. This stuff is meant to trick you. Um, it just is going to take practice with that. Um, and again, teaching them, if you're unsure, just call me, let me know. Um, and eventually they will learn. I've done the same with my parents. They don't click on links. Um, you also still need to practice your cybersecurity basics. Um, the way I think of it is you, having a, a lock on your front door. You should use basic antivirus software. You should have passwords that aren't one, two, three, four, five. Um, that you can you know, remember. You should, if you ever have the ability to use something called two-factor authentication, you should always turn it on. Um, just using these basic sort of things are going to prevent a remarkable amount of attacks, which again, depend a lot of the times on a human having a moment of carelessness and clicking or downloading something that they shouldn't. Um, and just having a general security awareness as you're going about online and in your activities. If something doesn't feel right, don't click it. You know, why is this free? Again, call your cyber 911 if you're ever unsure. Um, and lastly, this is where it comes into what I've been working on. So the only way that we can win this game, which is just unfair with the hackers, we need to change the rules of this game. So my suggestion to my clients and those I'm working with is that in your computer network, set up trap decoys, things that look like the sort of things that a hacker would go to. The goal is we want to coax easy to detect behavior. The picture you see here is my method that I use for explaining this to farmers. What you see here is a pheromone trap. It is a piece of cardboard that has sprayed on it a uh, pheromone from a defoliating insect. And it's sticky and the farmer simply puts them around on their field. And if there's bugs on it, you know that you know, you need to spray. Uh, same with things like rat poison. You need to get early warnings. You want to catch it before it gets really, really bad because that's when you can stop it. I've heard too many horror stories where people call for help after they've already given $20,000 to what they thought was Microsoft and there's nothing that can be done. Um, so just explaining a little bit more how these, you know, traps can detect pests. So the way it works is that a farmer would go around and put these traps around their fields, around their gain silos, everything that they want monitored. And then they simply look at it as they go around. If they see any signs of activity, they record it. And if they know that it rises to a certain level, we know now that there is pet infestation of some sort. What that means is that now it is time to spray, apply your pesticides, set additional rodent traps, do everything you normally would, um, except that now we've only used the minimum amount required. We only spray when there's an actual infestation as opposed to just because. Um, and then you reset the traps and resume. Um, and it's a very cost-effective way of doing it. Well, if we apply the same thought to detecting, hack to detecting hackers, so instead of things on a farm, think of them as computers and objects on your normal network. My product is called the Sentinel Box. It's an early warning system which would install to that network. Um, it deploys these trap decoy workloads, which I call sentinels, that look, again, exactly like the sorts of thing a hacker would want to attack. And then we simply monitor them uh, for any sort of signs of malicious activity. If anything is detected, we now know something bad is happening. The defender and the cyber 911 is now alerted. And now we've sort of caught the bad guy early before the ransom can go out. 
And that was sort of the way that there's that I found to solve this problem. Um, and we would then send more sentinels out of the type that were triggered. And we could do this indefinitely until the hacker just eventually gives up. And you reset the system and go on. And that's really all I had. Um, this has been a fantastic session. Um, while we've got a few more minutes, what questions can I answer for you? Well timed, Colin. Boy, you are like right, right on the minute there. I gotta mm -hmm. say, you had to, had to choose between so many different things you could talk about. Um, if you don't want to say a question out loud, you can put it in the chat. You can stop sharing so we can see faces. Yep. Yeah. And according to, I'll send this out. If you have, if you. Have